Hi everybody, this is James Chai. I apologize for not coming up a little bit sooner today in regards to um, uh, broadcasting. Just been dealing with some things today. And uh, Anyhow, it is October 7th, 2019. This is episode 13 of my live vlog broadcast. And I'm going to go over a few things. Uh, the two heading titles it may may not change during this uh, conversation of mine. But it's going to be about trigger stacking and flooding incorrectly as well as the psychology of dog codependency behavior and then I'll do some members questions so I'm not and then when I mean members I'm talking about the members who are in my uh, my closed uh, reactive dog group uh, which is great I want to thank everybody who has been uh, uh, joining my group it is now over 2,000 people which is part of the membership which is just phenomenal I really love that thank you all for for doing so uh, there are a few people that I probably will end up kicking out of that group um, just, uh, I'm just kind of getting tired of, uh, some of the things that, uh, a couple people have said, which is just, unfortunately, um, just don't need that in my group. Uh, I want people to be a bit more positive in regards to supporting other, uh, owners who have trouble with their dogs and getting, um, you know, unfortunately, there's always going to be people who want to watch the world burn. So if you see yourself in my closed group, this is why. I just uh, think that we need to be a cohesive aspect of being together and, and trying to support each other, uh, uh, especially owners who have dogs that are reactive. It's already difficult for them. And then to have people say silly things, um, it's difficult to, to accept. Uh, the other thing is in my closed group, uh, my reactive dog group, the link is in my description. Uh, the closed group is available to anybody who wants to join and... Um, you know, if you have any questions, you're welcome to post. And I might be transitioning to the part of uh, answering these questions uh, on video versus doing it with uh, with typing it all out. Just because I think I get a lot more viscerally uh, conveyed through by talking about it versus trying to type it all out. And then sometimes it loses that. And I have to be somewhat succinct as well as, uh, you know, all that stuff. So it makes it a little bit difficult. But uh, yeah, so today uh, I will be going over a few things. I uh, don't know how long it's going to be. It's about 9.30ish Pacific Standard Time here on the West Coast. Uh, so I have the links down. Uh, please support my pro bono work here with my vlogs. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm now over 400 subscribers, which is uh, just, uh, I'm so uh, um, flattered and humbled by that. Um, because, you know, it's just like two months ago, I only had about 220 followers. So this is kind of cool. And, um, all right, so uh, the links are there for my YouTube channel, for Twitter, and for Instagram as well. As And you'll notice something that's new in my description is the addition of uh, two fundraising uh, platforms that I'm now using, Patreon and GoFundMe. Those links are there too. If you'd like to donate, that'd be awesome. Even a dollar helps. And then this way it allows me to keep doing what I'm doing here online. But also, when there's enough funds... I will then start donating sessions with the funds. I'll match uh, dollar for dollar. I'll um, give pro bono sessions to people who have fixed incomes or rescue organizations and people who do need the ability to have some, you know, really highly skilled information in regards to their dogs. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people who are on fixed incomes don't have the ability to, you know, afford even hundred dollars for a dog training uh, session especially when it comes to behavioral issues so this is my effort to try to um, give back to the community again doing this pro bono so if y'all can share my posts that'd be very much appreciated the stuff that I was talking about yesterday uh, a lot of it was to do with leash use you know being a, a um, dominant control of the leash what I call the leash ninja you want to be a leash ninja so that you're in charge of your leash and you know what's going on you're always paying attention and then from that leash part uh, things can go from there I think one of the things a few people had said uh, in the comments after my broadcast is that sometimes their leash is too long drags on the ground so they end up picking it up and uh, and you know trying to hold it in their hands uh, what I'll do is I won't answer it today but I'll answer it in a future um, uh, future uh, broadcast regards to working with the leash a little bit more in detail physically uh, today I'm going to go a bit more details of the psychology that is behind the dog training aspects that I do and how is it that a, a guy like me with absolutely no training no experience whatsoever was able to work with the most extremely dangerous Great Danes and other dogs uh, in the North America when 
every single trainer, behaviorists, master dog trainers, uh, people who have written university textbooks on dog training and dog psychology, ethology, and animal behavior, haven't have turned down those same dogs saying they, those uh, those dogs were too dangerous. How did a guy like me do this? And again, it's because I didn't go through the, the the traditional aspects of dog training. And if I had followed traditional dog training, I would never have worked with a, even a dangerous dog, much less an extremely dangerous or predatorial dog. Because I would have been taught to be too scared of them. And I would have shut down mentally and emotionally and intuitively from being able to read these psychogenetic markers and behavioral nuances of these dogs that are reacting at one tenth of a second. I am very fortunate uh, with a gift from God to be able to read dogs at two tenths of a second with 100% accuracy, with no treats, no medication, and so forth. What I am doing are the same things that you yourself can learn how to do. And I'm just going to explain those psychological aspects of it over the course of time. And in the beginning, uh, these first few broadcasts, a lot of the stuff is going to kind of allow everyone to get an idea of how I talk, what I think about so forth and then as things go on maybe you know in a couple of weeks or months i'll start to get to a bit more detailed in the psychology that i myself have uh, have observed with dogs and the nuanced behaviors how dogs process time which i've already said is through abstract memory and how um, dogs process pain how dogs uh, process prey how they process their field of vision how dogs velocity target how you can micro train passive train and in motion train all these little things that we do on our normal day-to-day -day behavior with other people with our own dogs this is what I'm going to uh, get into detail as, as we go further along uh, I do hope that my numbers can increase my subscribers can increase the people who are following my page can increase because and that gives me more incentive to to know that people do understand what I'm talking about are doing it themselves and are going to be successful and you'll see that a lot of people have made comments where they have said it is working. So it's tough. I'm getting kicked out of dog training groups all the time. I'm just going to take this off. Sorry. I'm getting kicked out of dog training groups all the time, which is uh, it's funny because now they're hearing me mention some of their posts and all that. And they're getting upset and then they're kicking me out of these groups. It doesn't really matter to me as much as the fact that it is a very sad state of affairs when you have people who are running dog training groups that have 2,000 or 60,000 members who don't want to look at the fact that there's a psychology behind dogs, including those dogs who are, uh, you know, reactive, dangerous, etc. And all you're getting is people running the same bag of tricks all the time and going, well, why is this not working? Okay, so uh, regards to um, um, uh, tonight's live broadcast, I've got some pre-notes here. So one of the first things I want to say is very important is that when you're working with your dog, when you're connecting connecting with your dog, when you're just hanging out with your dog, it's very important that you use conversational tone with your dog. Just regular talking. Like right now I'm talking kind of broadcasty-like, but when you're just talking to anybody, if you're talking to them on the phone, a friend, or you're talking to your coworker or your neighbor, you're just talking, hey, you know what, this is what happened, this is what happened, and this is a cool day, I saw this and that. Your dog understands this. Every single dog understands the tone. They understand the inflection, the rhythm, the cadence, all those things about that. Your dog understands how it flows. And they understand that when we're talking in our conversational tones with other human beings, we're not in a stress situation. And if we are in a stress situation, you notice how sometimes when we're talking to somebody, we get a little bit stressed out or if we're on the phone and we get a little bit stressed out and our dog starts to get a little bit like, uh-oh, what's going on? What's going on? And then... We notice that our dog gets a little bit upset, so we look at our dog and go, okay, hey, you know what? And then we change our tone back down. Because we intrinsically know that the rhythm and the tone of our voice is affecting our dogs. Because our dog's not used to the conversational tone that we're having, they're used to us being like really high-pitched and, hi, how are you doing and all that stuff. Your dog knows that it's not genuine. Your dog knows, all dogs know, that are domesticated, that when we talk in those higher tones of, of voice, it's not sincere, it's disingenuous that there's something being hidden by the way we talk. And that inflection tones, depending on how high we go up as well or how disingenuous it is, also indicates to our dog aspects of play or prey drive that we can then elicit from them in a 
uh, in proper circumstances, but in general talk, when we do that, it throws our dog off and then our dog doesn't have a connection with us. Because again, when you talk to your dog, talk in conversational tones, your dog then understands that you're talking to them in a regular tone without stress, but also that your dog understands that you're talking to your dog with the same level of respect that you talk to your loved one, that you talk to your parents, that you talk to your, your children, that you talk to your partner. When we talk in conversational tones, your dog understands that same level of respect. And if you have respect from your dog, it's because you've given them respect. Same thing like I said before in a, in a few broadcasts before, uh, I think my first or second one, um, you know, if we go to a restaurant and the waiter comes up to us and they go uh, to us and say, hi, how are you today? This is, we've got these great specials on. Right off the bat, we can hear the tone or we go to buy a car and, or, you know, if we have the money to buy a car, we go to buy a car and the salesperson comes up and goes, hey, you know what, you need this car. And they always have this kind of voice, right? Everybody's trying to sell you something always has this voice because they're trying to convince us to buy something that they want to get rid of, which means that they're not genuine versus the fact that when we're talking to each other, we just, we talk to each other. So we want to keep the conversation tone going as sincere as it is with our dogs. And you'll notice a lot of times that if we're not able to have a conversational tone with our dog, a conversation, we end up talking too much and we're talking repetitively, repetitively about the same thing over and over again to our dog. Even like giving our dog a command recall, if we say something to our dog and say for them to come, we'll just repeat it. We'll keep, we keep repeating ourselves. Come here, come, 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 come here. And then it confuses our dog because they don't understand our language because it just becomes like nagging and barking and so forth like that. Um, so we do, when we talk differently to them, we cause our dog to feel that they're not inclusive to our home, they're not inclusive to our family, they're not part of us, because again, they're feeling, even though they don't show it, they're feeling marginalized in the way we treat them. And so there's a difference between our dog being our companion and our friend, versus our dog just feeling as if they are part of the household and they feel themselves in a much more substandard position. The aspect of codependency, which your dogs are overt codependents, it's important that our dogs understand that the codependency that they have with us, because we are covert codependents, you know, we love to fall in love with people, we love to hang out with people, but we don't go gushing all over the road, going, oh my gosh, like that, oh, I love you and everything. But dogs do, because they're always jumping on us, etc., etc. And the dog's jumping and is insecurity, codependency, uh, various other types of uh, affectations on the dysfunctional level. But again, like I say, I, I want to get more to that. Uh, more in-depth apps, depth aspect of those things versus um, just kind of doing what everybody else is doing. So it does make sense to talk to uh, to our dogs the same as we do to humans. And when you start talking to your dogs that same way, you will find that connection. And and again, I have had people in my closed group uh, that have said that they are starting to talk to their dog normally and saying things like instead of stop barking, they're saying stop yelling. And using other types of conversational words, regular conversational words, and their dogs are looking at them like, hey, why are you talking to me like people? And then the dog becomes even more engaged because they realize the way we talk to somebody that we have a, a physical affection with, they're now realizing that they themselves are receiving that same type of tone of voice, which again is, is that part, right? Because if you've ever met somebody who talks to you in a certain way, and then you see them talking to somebody else in a certain way, and and say for example they're you know talking somewhat down to you, but then they go to somebody else where they respect more, and they start talking to them in a regular voice, or they talk up to them as a part like, oh my gosh, I, I love this person, you know, like meeting some famous movie actor, going, oh my gosh, wow, that's amazing, um, and you know even even actually for example if you were to meet a a, a well known actor. If we talk to them in a uh, in a way where they're put up on a pedestal, like we automatically go, "Oh my gosh, this person's amazing!" You know, I can't believe it. When we talk to them on that pedestal, they themselves feel disengaged. They themselves feel not like it's really important. And I I do have some people that are uh, been on TV series on CBS and all that stuff, and the last thing that they want to hear is somebody treating them not like themselves. And it's really interesting 
when we do give that respect to people because then they want to become friends and respect each other in that reciprocal manner. So um, the next thing is, and I've got some questions, members questions I want to answer. So I don't want to take up too much time today, uh, just going over this, this other part. Uh, so I talked about the psychology of dog codependency behavior earlier in regards to our conversation. Because dogs are overt codependents and humans are covert codependents, because the dogs are outwardly energetic, codependent, I want to be with you. And humans are a bit more closed fisted in the sense that we don't really want to expose our feelings. Because, of course, human nature, if we expose our feelings, then we get ridiculed, we get bullied, we get intimidated by people who think, oh, you shouldn't be that affectionate or you shouldn't be that outwardly open or you're just odd and strange for being emotionally free. Unfortunately, our society has really tampered us down and suppressed us from being emotionally free. Whereas with the dog, they're just like all over the place and they just love being happy. So covert codependency, overt codependency, hand in hand, fist in fist, just like martial arts, right? Martial arts. So that's what we want to do is we want to understand that the codependency that exists with dogs is the loyalty, it's the trust, it's the respect our dogs have for us. It's the fact that our dogs will trust us even when they are with abusive people they will still come back because they believe in that codependency that is there. And they are still there. And even the dog that has been abused by an owner will still defend that owner in the event that owner is at, at physical risk of injury from some stranger or something like that. And that's a logic we need to understand. Our dogs are going to defend us with their life, even though they don't realize that they could die or be killed, like those uh, police dogs. They're still going to do everything that they're supposed to do out of loyalty, dependency, training, etc. But at the end of the day, they're going to continue to do what they can for us because they are part of our family and they expect us tacitly, inherently, to also be part of their family and to give them that bond and love. It's the same thing when, uh, I was talking about uh, in earlier episodes in regards to walking with your dog on leash and if your dog gets attacked by another dog that's off leash or on leash uh, that if we don't protect our dog our dog feels that we've let them down that we can't defend them we can't defend us we can't defend our entire nucleus of our family um, okay so well, a few things that people have kind of mentioned in regards to um, you know, working with their dogs is that sometimes uh, you know their dog will be reactive for example, a dog that is reactive to other dogs, he's going to, or he, she, that dog is going to be reactive. And the dog is going to keep going and keep fighting at the leash. So they're trying to pull all the, at the leash to get to the other dog, to either attack the other dog or to run up to the dog and start to scare the other dog. Excuse me. So your dog is going to keep pulling on the lead because that's where they've driven themselves to. Your dog is only understanding that there's a risk in front of them, which is this other dog that they don't know if that other dog is going to attack them or they're human. So in your dog's uh, perspective, your dog is going to save us or protect us, or put up a brave front of offense by going after the other dog, by putting on a show. And it's important for us to realize that um, they're going to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. One of the unfortunate uh, things that are out there in the dog training industry, uh, and it's brought on by academia, it's brought on by ignorance, unfortunately, because of the inexperience. Because again, we're talking about the professionals out there that are only working with 60% of the dogs. That's their success rate. They're dealing with 60% of the dangerous, reactive, extremely dangerous, predatorial dogs. And they're giving the dogs treats and medication. And if the dog is not complying, they just go, forget it, whatever. The dog can't be helped, right? If a dog attacks another dog, that's a level five, level five dog, according to Dr. Ian Dunbar's scale. And if the dog doesn't respond to treats, the actual recommendation by Dr. Ian Dunbar is to kill that dog. And it's the same thing that the SPCA does as well here in Vancouver and British Columbia, BC SPCA. They do the same thing. Uh, they have their animal kind uh, trainer certification program, which is just a redundant aspect of just, you know, it's, it's a monetary incentive for them. But what they do is they are saying that they're training and certifying dog trainers and behaviors up to the standard that the BCSPCA 
provides or offers or says that they offer, which is just a redundant application because there are already several accreditation uh, um, uh, uh, facilities out there in North America and abroad. So the BCSPC is doing a redundant aspect and it's a financial aspect of it. Uh, the other part is the hypocrisy, hypocrisy, hypocrisy of, uh, of, uh, of that animal kind program because, uh, as I said in a few other episodes uh, back, uh, the BCSPCA uh, was not able to train a, a, a puppy under a year old that, um, that was excited, ripped the, the pant leg of, its, uh, of their uh, new uh, adoptive family, and the BCSPCA actually seized the dog back and killed the dog, a puppy under a year old. And uh, you know, the irony was when I talked about the other day, I was looking for that link and in the beginning probably four or five months ago that link was at one or two from the top and now when you google um, uh, uh, BC SPCA kills puppy North Vancouver that link that used to be in global news and all that stuff is now on the second page and when you google those same phrasing that same BC SPCA kills puppy is now being filled up with keywords that link back to the BCSPCA. So this is a facility that uh, received $39.1 million in donations in 2018. And what are they doing? They're taking donations from, from you guys and using it to buy away the negative publicity and their failure to be able to train a dog. That's, that's obfuscation. That is uh, 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 duplicit and it's immoral to do so, to, to deliberately buy away bad news that they themselves cause and that the hypocrisy of it is they're certifying dog trainers and behaviors. And those dog trainers and behaviors don't know what's going on even though they know the knowledge of the BCSBCA history of killing a puppy and other dogs with behavioral issues, simple behavioral issues. And uh, it's an unfortunate thing because, uh, you know what, I get a lot of flack. I get a lot of flack because I don't follow the cliques. I don't follow the dog training groups. I don't follow the 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 uh, the marketing, the the branding, the the oh, let's all make it all look pretty and beautiful. I look at the history, the health, and the longevity of dogs. And when I see organizations doing stuff like this, it's really disgusting. I actually have a, an organization in Los Angeles that is uh, just f completely failed me, and. Um, and the dog themselves uh, that they sent up to me, which is just uh, horrific. It's really horrific. And uh, as things go forward, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna bring out some details about this. Uh, that's what kind of really upset me today is uh, these organizations that are only interested in their own uh, satisfactions and not the dogs themselves. And it's pretty pathetic, really quite pathetic. Um, and you know they're making over a million dollars in donations themselves. And um, yeah, it's sad. I, I really wish there were people out there that, that, that ran organizations that large that actually believed in the dogs themselves. And, and it's not cool. Okay, so um, that's my little bit of a rant this morning. Uh, um, sorry, this evening. So um, just getting back to the part when your dog tires you out, it's normal for dogs to t try to tire anybody out. It's just their natural behavior to do this. They're just going to keep going and going. Dogs are burst predators. They're not long distance, they're not endurance predators. They're built for burst predatorial aspects. They're out there to chase after an animal, their prey for as fast and as quick as they can. And their ability to maintain anything on a sustained level of endurance doesn't normally happen. And that also is, is just part of the predatorial aspect of the dogs. So what ends up happening is that there are a couple of uh, silly statements, silly labels out there. And those two labels are called trigger stacking and flooding. Trigger stacking, uh, according to this archaic aspect of it, trigger stacking is when there's an issue, uh, a reaction, a trigger to the dog, and then there's another trigger, and then there's another trigger, and then the dog keeps, you know, trigger stacking. And then the other one is called flooding, where you just, uh, where they say, well, then the dog is overwhelmed with a whole bunch of things and can't do anything. And then the, the, the dumb claim or statement from, um, from these uh, academics is that then the dog shuts down. 
etc. And uh, it just shows the lack of understanding that uh, academia has as a fumble along while killing six million dogs annually for behavioral issues that can easily be understood if they spent the time uh, off of their um, uh, yeah I'm just really kind of irritated by this because there's just dogs being killed all the time trigger stacking being exposed to one thing and another thing another thing and another thing and another thing flooding being surrounded by everything and all that stuff and they say this stuff uh, and it's so silly because of the fact is the dog is processing triggers at one tenth of a second your dog is able to process that instantaneously fast and I've used it as an example for for if you to take a treat and your dog is sitting there or standing there and you drop that treat without even letting your dog know the instant you drop it it'll the your dog will snap it out of the air it's the same thing when we used to do it with our, you know, our coins or our quarters or whatever when we were kids. And we're like, okay, if you can catch this, you get to keep it. And every single time, the instant it drops, we, we miss it, we miss it, we miss it. Your dog is picking that up that fast. That's how fast your dog is processing triggers at that time, which means your dog is able to process all these triggers. And what ends up happening is because these, uh, these um, uh, trainers and behaviors become scared and they don't know what's going on. And they don't know how to read what's going on with these dogs' behavior. They say the dog is being triggered by stacks and, and, and being flooded and blah, 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 blah. But in actual fact, again, the dog is processing things at that time. It just the, the, the professional uh, is not able to understand what the dog is doing. It's the same thing. Is, I mean, how many people know of a, of a neighbor whose dog is behind a fence and this is a reactive dog? And if you were to go up to the fence, that dog would just keep barking at you and keep running the fence, keep barking at you and barking at you. You could stand there for half an hour and the dog's going to keep barking at you. You could stand there for an hour and the dog will keep barking at you. Go to a shelter, do some volunteer work. And if you go out and stand beside a, a, a shelter, a kennel door where a dog has been triggered by you just standing there, you can stand there for an hour and the dog will continue barking at you. The dog doesn't get tired or whatever. He'll just keep doing it because it's a defensive measure by being offensive, etc. But your but that dog will continue to go on and on. And you could wait an hour and the dog starts going up again. It's not trigger stacking. It's just the way the dog is processing what is going on. And the, usually what that happens to is when you're there for half an hour, an hour, the dog will eventually just stop and just watch you. And then the minute you move, the instant you go towards the fence, that dog will then start reacting again. So the dog's not flooded. The dog's not trigger stacked. It's just a normal behavior of a dog on a predatorial or a defensive measure, which the dog is exhibiting in their own defensive measure, which is to be offensive, to go after you and to say, hey, stay away from me, don't do this. If you do so, I'm gonna bite your bite your head off or whatever, right? So it's not trigger stacking. It's, it, it, I just wish the industry would wake up and realize it's not called trigger stack. And there's no, it, it, it's just a misnomer. It's an anthropomorphi anthropomorphization of human conjecture. There's no trigger stacking. There's no flooding. Your dog's able to process. And if you can actually process your dog at that speed, that, that frame, at one-tenth or two-tenths of a second, you're going to see everything make sense with a dog's behavior. And the only reason why it's seems like he's getting angrier and angrier or more reactive and reactive is because we're not proceeding our behavior appropriate for our dog's reactions, our dog's behavior to those triggers. All the dogs that I have, uh, have worked with in the videos, uh, personally, these are dogs that are just way beyond uh, the, the general accepted type of dogs that people work with. I mean, I was looking at a couple of groups yesterday and there's a couple of uh, posts in, in some of these dog training groups where they're talking about, well, you know, this dog, I've, I've again, it's always, this, I've had, you know, worked with dogs all my life, re aggressive dogs, reactive dogs, etc. But now I have this dog that I don't know what to do and I've tried everything and the dog has uh, no medical issues, which again is kind of so uh, the dog has no medical issues, and I say silly, sorry, in the, in the point of why does everybody go and say there's a medical issue with a dog that's angry? 
The dog's angry. The dog's reactive. The dog is aggressive. Yes, but he's angry. He's upset. Emotionally, there's a reason. There's a codependency issue that's been violated, or there's a territory. There's an insecurity or an unsecurity. There are issues that are going on that impact the dog. Maybe the dog has low self-esteem. Maybe the dog has low self-confidence. Maybe the dog has a high sense of self-worth. All these aspects of, uh, of identity in the dog. Dog's own ability to process on an emotional and logical rudimentary basis is what's not being seen and um, it's just really tough uh, to do so um, okay and the thing is it's not like you know and, and people think I kind of rail off on the trainers and behaviors it's not really the trainers and the behaviors it's the people at the top who only get stuck in one little thing and then they get all these amazing compliments and they get all these incredible like, oh my gosh, I got to see Karen Pryor and all this stuff. And, and, and it's like, and then what ends up happening, those people who get fed that and get put on the pedestal can't step off of it because it's a drug to them. It's a drug, that ego that, that is being fed is a drug. And when, you, when they allow that drug to be fed into them, they forget that the dog themselves is a life. That the dog themselves, each individual dog has a life and has the ability to be helped and to be psychologically assessed, evaluated at a one-tenth second process time. Again, why do vets prescribe psychopharmaceuticals? Why do they prescribe Prozac, all that stuff? Because they're trying to address a psychological issue with your dog, which means if it's a psychological issue, why don't we check out the animal behavior, the science of it and the psychology of it and work that down? Destructure it. It's, it's not that hard to do. We just have allowed ourselves to go down the rabbit hole I mean, I was watching something the other day uh, about uh, Ivan Pavlov, and it turned out he was a very cruel, evil person, actually, with the way he treated dogs. And most of the dogs, uh, and I remember reading this, uh, um, uh, watching this thing, and I'm going, wow, this is uh, just brutal. But he would starve these dogs essentially to death within days. He would do surgery on uh, just uh, horrible things, horrible, horrible things. And so it, it's because... You know, we've come to the point of seeing dogs as just simply property. They're not recognized in law uh, other than as property. And that comes from the people at the top, the, the top behaviors, the top uh, uh, trainers, and all these people with TV shows and everything like that. They're just, they don't understand anything further than the 60% that they have to test with and that's with treats as well i mean they're using treats to train these dogs at the 60 per, you know 40 50 60 percentile level of these dogs take away the treats from from these trainers and behaviors and they're 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 a level three a v3 a v4 on my scale out of a 10 they're v3 v4 skilled professional without treats and then they're attempting to brute force it by giving treats and food to the dog and going, well, you know, if the dog doesn't take the treats and the dog needs to be killed, as Dr. Ian Dunbar has been, been quoted as saying and in, in his writings. Whereas absolutely nobody has ever acknowledged that, even though they know it's the truth, that nowhere in the entire canine species does food or uh, does food exist as a communication device. Food is not used at all. There's, there's no use of food by canines the dog doesn't bring food to each other as a as a treat as a reward as a communication device it's a sustenance it's how the dog stays happy how the dog survives but instead uh, our, our our behaviors our, our our people such as temple grand and all these people at the top are saying you got to give the dog food that way you get the dog to comply ridiculous it's it's just it kills me it hurts, actually. It doesn't kill me. It hurts me deep inside because I see all of this stuff and it takes me seconds, well, you know, two-tenths of a second all stuff. And the, and the people who have hired me, they're doing it too. They're learning it how. And then I've got the trainers and behaviors that are reaching out to me and saying, well, okay, you know, it's kind of crazy what you're talking about, but can you explain? And, and in my closed group, I have people who are there who are who actually want to, the trainers and behaviors who are actually wanting to learn about something different. Even if it's not for them, they're still open-minded. You guys are still open-minded where you're saying, hey, you know what? I wouldn't mind just figuring out something. Hey, if I don't if I don't 
know how to do it or if I can't embrace it, but at least I can kind of pick up a couple of things. And if it helps me, it'll help my client's dogs. And some of these guys, uh, some of these trainers, behaviors, they go on to actually embrace what I'm talking about without trying to figure out what I'm understanding because they're just approaching it simplistically, like I keep telling everybody. And then they go on to be rock stars with their dog owners because then the dog owner is like, oh, wow, that's a really good psychological profiling that you did. I've never heard that before. And then they're happy about it because we've I've given them the details to look for in their dog's behavior. And then the behavior is doing it themselves. But then we got the people again at the top who are too afraid to say that they're wrong, like that uh, that um, uh, that 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 person that was referred to in the Huffington Post. It's just like what, what, right? I mean, you can't even admit that you're wrong. And then the dog dies. All right. Anyways, okay. So I'm gonna go to the members' questions. Um, this is from my uh, reactive dog group, and like I say, everybody is welcome to join. The link is in the description already. And I'll go over all this later on tonight uh, and to put key points on, on the on the main stuff. When it comes to the answers to the uh, members' questions, I'm probably not going to go into too much detail uh, writing it out because this stuff takes me four to six hours to, to do each night. And so it's kind of tough. It was so bad. I mean, I, I, I'm forgetting to, to schedule the, uh, um, clients, uh, which is not cool. I, today, someone phoned me up and I was like... Oh my gosh, I forgot. Like I didn't even schedule it. I just it just slipped my mind. So I got to get a little bit more organized, and it's hard to do because if I don't work, I don't have money, and then I can't do this. So it's, you know, I, but I live a I live a pretty modest. Life. Okay, uh, so member questions from our reactive dog group. Uh, number one, uh, Jennifer G. So Jennifer says, "Hi James," and, and these are people who have posted in my group before. So I'm just responding back to further. Uh, progress that their dogs are doing now to the you know next step or to to revisit what has happened hi james i know you've talked about touching of a dog's paw being about trust i can cut my, my uh, dog pearl's nails but it's a major effort i must get her on her back and or on her side and um what she had talked about too jennifer had said before is that when her um you know uh, okay so we're, we're just gonna go to that part i'm not i'm not gonna go because i got about 25 minutes here before um i go into an hour um, okay, so about uh, uh, clipping your dog's nails, it's really tough, right? Because again, we're talking. You remember I said yesterday about the hypersensitivity of dogs. Hypersensitive. You can touch a dog just like that. You can blow on the fur, and they immediately react. They immediately feel it. A dog that's reactive or skittish or touch, they'll immediately turn. Like I said, I've had dogs who have not just Walter, but I've had dogs who have turned on me. Instantly, uh, clients' dogs turned on me instantly when I've gone to just 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 lightly touch them. So you got to realize that the dog's paws, as much as they're walking on concrete and on on rocks and on you know metal grates, crossing bridges, etc., it's sensitive. And for something to be a vibration, which is going to be the uh, if you're using a grinder like a Dremel, that vibration, right? The dog it goes right through their arm and all that, and they can't even process it. And the interesting thing is because that Dremel is creating vibrations faster than the dog is processing at that one tenth of a second, because the the Dremel is spinning at thirty thousand rotations a minute. Your dog's now able to process process that or understand that that vibration. So it's got to be about a a bit about trust that goes on. Uh, the other the thing you're not using a Dremel but you're using a grinder you can use those little uh, those clips where you know you put the nail through and the uh, I should have brought it to you I'm sorry um, uh, to show you but you can put the, the the nail through and then you just clip it off right away I usually do that for my dogs I know a lot of people like to kind of make it look pretty and they they want to grind their dogs nails all around uh, but I use a clipper just because I mean they're they're huge dogs to begin with and on top of that when we take our dogs out for a walk onto the pavement it's going to start to, to to grind it to smooth down the edges anyhow. Uh, another thing actually before I forget that is if you are not able to get your dog to be able uh, to, to get their nails clipped or to, to have a Dremel on it, a uh, grinder on it, and you're active, take your dog to the beach. Take your dogs out on trails. The sand, the rocks, the gravel will passively grind and, and shorten their nails. And that part is, is another way you can do it, get you out for exercise, etc. 
Uh, but when it comes to the point of just trying to be able to clip your dog's nails, uh, if you can't do the grinder, the only other thing you can do with that is to have your dog learn to be trusting you to hold them. So I always start off at the at the top here when I'm working with them, and I'll work them down uh, over days and or you know successive times for clipping is I'll you know eventually be able to them down, hold them down, and so forth like that, and just work it way down. So and I'll kind of squeeze a little bit so that the dog gets a little bit distracted as well and, and I'm not moving it down while I'm trying to clip them of course but I mean you know I'll start from here and then the next time I'll start from here then I'll move it down and move it down everybody has their own preferences of how you do it um, if your dog is reactive or dysfunctional in the sense then you know either take them to a professional who is aware that you let them know that my dog is somewhat reactive or is reactive to being touched on there that my dog will be unhappy so that they're not caught aware and they get bitten, which is really bad for them, uh, for a professional. Um, but again, do that. If you can't, uh, when you're having them, you can also put a muzzle on them. I have some dogs here, when they first did, uh, first arrived, to try to clip their nails would have been uh, extremely dangerous. And so I've been able to muzzle uh, them and then be able to clip their nails. Uh, I, I have had uh, giant dogs that I can't even muzzle them because they'll be very upset, so I just end up going, I gotta walk you for an hour, and then the next day, and the next day, and then they start, you know, shortening it down. So that's the only other way to do so. Um, you know, when the dog has the quick in the nail, right, that little that little part where the blood will come off, you cut their nails too short. Uh, I was told by a breeder a few years ago that you can actually chase the nail, uh, the quick down, by successive times of cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, cutting it, and each time then the nail itself, I mean the quick itself, starts to retreat a little bit more, a little bit back, a little bit back more. But that takes, you know, a year to do so uh, if you have that much patience. But again, when you're trying to um, uh, grind your dog's nails, the only aspect is for them to trust you. And by getting them used to you touching them, even when you're not working with a nail, just laying there, just do that. Keep touching them, get them tickle their paws, letting them get acclimate acclimated to you touching them letting your dog get acclimated to being sensitive because it's ticklish to them it really is ticklish to them uh, i have one dane here that if i if i if i uh, rub his chest and i rub it actually a little bit too hard a little bit too uh, you know ticklish he'll he'll get really angry and start to bite me because he doesn't understand but then when i go back to just a regular kind of you know nice hard rub or a nice soft pet he's like oh, okay whatever so i Kind of always test him, and he's like, all right, and, and, and you know, he's got a huge, huge mouth. Um, but again, yeah, so that's that's the one way that you can do, Jennifer. Uh, a couple of the ways is again, letting them get used to it, tickle their their insides of the paws, and and even with the nails, what I'll do with their nails as well is I'll flick them every once in a while, not hard because it's gonna hurt. Like same thing if someone did that to me, so I just flick them a bit. I'll tap the nails, I'll tap the nails while I'm watching TV or a movie with them, etc. And then it gets them desensitized. So I hope that kind of helps a bit. I know it's it's not perfect information. I have to give generic information because it's tough. Um, and the next one, Jennifer asks a second question in the group. I've been working hard with Pearl. Today we went to Starbucks with my roommate and she was perfect. No barking or jumping. And that's after I gave uh, Jennifer a, a, um, a down training advice on how to deal with her re dog reactive dog. And so uh, Jennifer continues. Uh, she was at ease. Then 20 minutes in, I heard dog tags. And there was a Rottweiler sitting under a table 30 feet away. Once Pearl heard and saw the other dog, the Rottweiler, game over. All her old behaviors came back. Lunging and barking at people, excuse me, especially men walking by that were uh, where she was sitting. Uh, she kept staring at the dog, barking. I know training takes time. I just feel like we took two steps forward and two steps back. I kept reassuring her she was okay. I asked her to stop, kept doing the touches, saying her name. Should I have introduced her to the other dog? What more could I have done? So what you could have done, and it's tough to predict, right? Because you walk around a corner and there's going to be a dog there one day. And you just can't tell. So um, it's impossible to predict, but you always want to keep an eye out. So even if you're hanging out with somebody, you're having your coffee, you're enjoying it. Like I've done this when I'm talking to people and I have a, one of my dogs with me. I'll be like, blah, 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 blah. Or I'll be talking to, to the person and I'll literally look at my dog and I'll say their name, and I'll touch them, I'll acknowledge them so that they themselves don't become uh, uh, disassociated in the conversation. Remember the conversation, talking to people? So that way, that dog that I'm with, I'll say their name, like, uh, you know, like uh, Bill, hi, Bill, hi, hi, good boy, Bill, and I'll touch him, 
let him know that I know he's there, right? It's kind of like, again, you're sitting on a couch watching a movie and then your boyfriend and girlfriend reaches over, touches your hand, and then you guys hold hands. That's what it is. So we want to remind our dogs that even if they're laying on the ground uh, while we're having a coffee by ourselves or with our friends, that we're still aware of them. So that keeps her from, that would keep Pearl from kind of losing the connection with you because then she feels a conversation that is always going on. On top of that, uh, when that does happen, if you st did steal, uh, did, did hear the dog tags, immediately address it to Pearl. Write down, uh, reach down, touch her, Pearl, you're okay, right? The instant, and if you can't catch it right away, because again, it can be a surprise, try to catch it immediately thereafter as instantaneously as you can and grab her and go, Pearl, you're okay. Um, that's really important to have that conversation. And so... 20 minutes is good by the sounds of it because uh, I guess normally she, you know, in your other posts are that she is somewhat reactive to dogs and all that stuff. Uh, and, um, you know, like no barking, no jumping on people, right? So you had said that. Uh, and again, it's using these simple techniques that are universal with all dogs. Um, so, um, so yeah, so she's, she's old behaviors came back, lunging and barking at people, especially men, etc., etc. So at the end of the day, you go back and you reset with her and you just stay. And you just commit. Because like I said earlier in this in my vlog, your dog is going to keep pushing it because that's just their nature. They're predacious. It's just going to keep like, ah, right? The, you know, you've seen the person who kind of is really kind of like skittish themselves in, in real life. And, and they get really kind of like OCD about something. And they don't, and you can't talk them down, right? We've all had that. You have, and that's a highly codependent person most times or, or introverted. And not able to deal with the, the external aspects of being in public, etc. And they're like, I bet. And you're like, just calm down. And you can't get them to calm down because they're consequentially thinking human beings. But with your dog, your dog is going to rely on you as a codependent aspect for you to reassure them by bringing your conversational tone down to them in a firm aspect of it so that they're listening to you. And when they're listening to you without the strain in your voice, even if you're getting tired, then you start to understand that there is no threat that you're perceiving. At the same time, you're holding them firmly and keeping them from being reactive. So when you write down as well, I just feel like we took two steps forward and two steps back. You didn't take two steps forward and two steps back. You took two steps forward. You took one step forward to the next plateau. You didn't step backwards. We're, we we don't, and I don't want anybody to ever think that something happened. And, you know, even if your dog attacked another dog because of whatever reason after you thought it was working forward, is not your dog going backwards. It's just your dog has hit a plateau in their ability to process cognitively and emotionally the environment that they're in, their field of vision, the perception of their, their stimulus. Your dog hasn't gone backwards. Your dog is there in a new perspective that they haven't been in before. Because that new perspective is, I haven't freaked out in 20 minutes and now I'm seeing something and so I've gone 20 minutes without freaking out. What do I do? Because I've never been here before. It's a new experience for your dog. You address it by addressing the codependency, their fear, their insecurity, that trust that your dog needs in you. That's all you do. That's where it goes at. So it's not going backwards. It is addressing the immediacy of that new plateau that your dog is at. So uh, don't think that you did anything wrong. Don't think that you failed. Don't, don't, don't live in the past of that event. You now know what happened. Use those strengths. Use that foundation to be able to build forward on that going, okay, so next time that happens, I have to pay more attention. I have to address Pearl, touch her, hold on to her, whichever it is, and I have to address it. And I have to be firm by telling her to stop. Not talking lots and lots to Pearl. You're just going to address it the same way as you did before. Because if you go back to the same key, basic training methods that I taught you in, in, in our closed group, you remind Pro of that same step again. She goes back and goes, okay, this is cool. I feel that. Just like comfort food. Just like when you, uh, you, you, you go home and visit your parents and your bedroom is still there. That's what we want to do. Okay. Um, so that's what you can do. Um, you know, try that and, and go from there. Okay, question number three, Monica Yu. Uh, Monica says uh, her dog, who's a rescue, um, uh, Todd is so loud that 
this and then she has a video up in my group in our group uh, our closed group there and she says you know and he's and he's like rah 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 which is really kind of cute actually right because they're talking they're engaging like the pawing at you the codependency aspect of it right see again everything's about codependency if we look at that that as a base point that our dogs are codependent everything that our dogs do makes sense why is our dog reactive because they're codependent why is our dog rah 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 because of the codependency because the need for our dogs to engage with us and to be recognized respected interacted with same thing like i said yesterday if you're a passenger in a car and the driver doesn't talk to you for a five-hour car ride and you try to talk with your, your driver and they don't talk to you 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 feel offended you feel violated you feel like this is not a relationship that we're in okay so um um so she says this was a quiet conversation we had this afternoon he literally talks to me or tries to especially when i'm telling him no I do not allow this kind of sass from my child, her human child. So why am I allowing his back talk? Am I codependent as well? So first off the bat, uh, Monica, it's because of the uh, the point that you have a high emotional context with your dog, uh, with Todd. And on top of that, in the beginning that you saw his uh, his conversational rah 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 with you, you thought it was cute, and then you made conversation with me but you're not looking at the context of when he's rah rah rahing with you in this place this environment to this place in this environment to this other place in that environment etc the video shows Todd is just looking out the patio door and he's walking around in the living room area and he's talking to you and then he goes back to the window and he rah rah and he's, like I said it's very cute so that conversation there is uh, and, and the language that you're using if you're going to have a conversation, it has to be relative. It has to have an interaction. That's why I say when I'm talking with my dogs here, I don't go and say, oh, you're such a cute little girl, blah, 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 blah. I say, oh, you're so cute. You're, you're really adorable and all that stuff. And then after a few seconds of that regular conversation, then I can sometimes go, oh, you're so cute and adorable. But I still try to keep that tone of conversation with them because I don't want to elicit any play or prey drive in them. I want them always to have a baseline of tone from me the voice which is the same thing we do in conversations with human beings with our friends we would never go hi you know right, right. Like that's our friends right because then they're gonna say dude you're weird you're, you're talking to me like i'm a toy i'm not a dog right and, and you definitely don't want to do that to your girlfriend or your boyfriend whatever uh because then they'll be like yeah this is not cool and actually sammy's right here i'm gonna bring sammy up here hang a sec sam sammy come come sammy Okay, so Sammy does. Sammy's a little, uh, little gun shy today, a little camera shy. Uh, I was gonna bring. Hi, Sammy. Okay, um, so you're not. It's not back talk with 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 uh, Todd, Monica. It's not back talk. You're just having a conversation with him, and he's trying to engage with you, and he's found by repeating certain key tones because you can hear the way he's been talking to you by rah rah rah. There's certain conversational tones that if you listen to it, you actually hear him repeat repetitive in those tones even though it has a little bit of a different pitch and so forth you can still hear those tones going up and down that are still the same that's why you can actually listen to what a dog is saying you can actually listen to what a dog is talking about same thing like you know they talk about the whales and their sirens and all that stuff and then you know decades later the scientists are like actually you know what they're actually talking this is what this sound like and this sound like and same thing with our dogs we know our dogs so well that when they do make different pitches is at home we know that there's something wrong we can tell if our dog's about to whine we can tell the tone of voice etc intuitively we know that so when Todd is making those tones listen to that video again and you will actually hear him being repetitive doesn't make me anything special it's what I what I you know I've learned to do what I have to do to survive uh, with other dangerous dogs and all that stuff the conversation they all they all can get to that point if you want to they know how to say it and they know when it's relevant and it's a codependent behavior that's relational to their ability to interact and find an engagement with you that's why i said talking about the psychological stuff uh it's fun for me um but again uh you know i do know um sometimes people sometimes people uh lose what i'm saying which uh, you know i apologize feel free to make, make comments etc etc and go from there um, okay, so number four, uh, this is another one in regards to uh, Linnea. She goes, Hi James, I'm having a hard time with Dozer to walk him. He stops and he won't go. Doesn't think he needs to listen to me and just wants to go back to the car. So this is when she 
takes him for a walk to the park and all that. I can't get him to exercise and he needs to release his energy. Any ideas? Off-leash parks are not an option. And that's because uh, in, in other posts and all stuff, and I've worked with Dozer through his rescue, uh, uh, Bulldog Rescue, um, is that Dozer tends to also be kind of uh, uh, reactive to other dogs. So that's why it's not an option. Um, and then earlier in a, in a post that she uh, uh, put in my uh, in our group about two months ago, about uh, when Dozer was outside, he actually got stung by a bee. I think a couple of times that happened, Linnea. And then that made Dozer very fearful of being outside because, of course, you're, you're getting stung by a bee. Like, what the heck? And that made him fearful, which is the same thing as a shock collar. All right, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Haha. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, he got stung by bees a couple of times this summer, but I don't think it's fear, nor do I think he's injured as he has no problem jumping up like into her vehicle, I would assume. I'm not sure what to do, but he needs to walk as we used to do a lot at the beginning of the year. Things slowed down in the summer as it was too hot for him to go on big walks. Now he mostly will barely go on any walks whatsoever. Any tips? Thank you. Uh, oh, P.S. This is us at the park today. Uh, she had posted a picture in our group. Uh, when he's uh, where he's done the loop, the same walking loop uh, multiple times, but today refused to leave the parking lot to even go to the loop trail. So that resistance is the insecurity, the distrust of feeling safe. And uh, because you had no control over a bee, he got stung. And then that made him realize, oh my gosh, every time I go outside, especially if I got stung at least twice, then he goes, it's going to before the time I go out because when is it gonna when am I gonna get stung again same thing with the shock collar when am I gonna get shocked again it, it, it causes him to to shut down when it comes to uh, the shock collar it's a it's a brute force aspect when it comes to the bees and all that stuff being in nature and a random aspect you don't have any control over it. how do you deal with it end of the day uh, you're going to have to kind of Take them on small, short walks. Like I was saying before in the post, I think two months ago, was to just kind of bring him outside in the yard and then start baby stepping him out into the sidewalk and then maybe the next house down, bringing him back home, right? So building up his tolerance, building up his acclimation, also making sure that you're watching for any bees or whatever that's going to be around him. That you have to make sure, same with mosquitoes, etc., because he's going to shut down on that end. Uh, and again, he doesn't want to go you're gonna push him a little bit forward in that sense of pulling on his lead I, I know he's wearing the harness which is great so he's just gonna basically push him on the lead uh, and I know he might be reactive if you try to pick him up or touch him or whatever but again if you can safely do so you want to kind of grab him by the bum or you know cup his bum and kind of lift him up and kind of pull him forward with a leash as you bring him forward a bit oh sorry as you uh, bum here and the leash here uh, close to his head and you want to kind of slightly pick him up and kind of push him forward kind of push him forward and I remember he's a pretty strong dog but uh, you want to kind of push him forward or pull him forward should I say a little bit you want to get him past the point of his refusal so this is where it's the same thing like your child is afraid to eat broccoli right just try it and then eventually oh I love the broccoli here's some cheese on it right uh, so the same thing with dogs you're going to try to push him forward. I'm not talking about treat training because, again, you could be somewhere one day without any treats and he just shuts down. And you're like, oh. So you want to pick up those techniques, this consistency, again, uh, his bum and bring him forward. If you can't do that, then bring him forward with a with the, the leash itself, with right? But then, again, he might just kind of pull back and go, I'm not doing it. you you got to kind of do it. More than anything else, too, is when he, you see him starting to walk and he's, and you can tell, right? Pay attention to, to Dozer and watch him. When he starts to shut down a little bit, when he starts to kind of collapse down, before that, just pull him forward again so he doesn't get an opportunity to drop his weight, drop his gravity down. Because all he's doing is he's saying, pull me. Good luck. Do it. Not because he's trying to challenge you. Not because he's trying to alpha you. Because he's afraid. So you got to get him past that point that, hey, the broccoli is not that yucky tasting. It's actually really good. You want to get him past that point so he moves forward a bit. And again, acclimate him, baby steps at a time, and bring him forward. Don't expect to say, I'm going to walk him down to the end of the block today. Think to yourself, I just want to walk him to the next house's uh, property line. And then we'll bring him back in. And then he'll get acclimated to that as well. Um, I've had that where uh, I had um, uh, Nina the Great Dane that came in from Taiwan. Um, uh, 
she was used as breeding. She had a wire wrapped around her mouth and etc. And I talked about this beforehand. Uh, what ended up happening is she was completely shut down because she was, you know, in a cage out in, in Taiwan, uh, being bred, uh, scarring, all that kind of stuff. And they treat dogs when they breed them quite horrifically as well. Um, backyard breeding, etc. But it's even worse in, in low educated uh, uh, people. So what ended up happening is that um, Nina couldn't go for a walk. She would shut down in the hallway uh, as I'm renting out. Uh, I was living in an apartment at the time, um, so I wasn't renting a house like I am now. And she couldn't even go through the hallway. And I was on the fourth floor, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even get her into the elevator. And I was literally one door, uh, one one apartment away from the elevator, and she wouldn't even go there. Um, and I was able to convince her because I would stop with her in the hallway outside my door, and I would reset with her like I showed you. I would reset her and then move her forward a foot. And then she would like, she would shut down and she's, you know, a hundred plus pound dog. And, and she would be fearful and all that stuff. And I'd reset her and move her forward again and move her forward and then get her into the elevator and then bring her downstairs and then get her to the front, uh, the foyer. And then eventually reset with her at the front door and reset her on the other side of the door and then get Nina outside. And then that would be it. Then I'd bring her back in and good job, good girl. And then I would spend some time to give her a hug and hold her and not, not, you know, when you hug them, you don't shake your hands and you don't overstimulate them because of the hypersensitivity that the dog has and when they already have anxiety you want them to feel safe so i'll just i would just give her the reset hold her firmly speak to her in conversational tones and then i would bring her back into the home and then eventually we got up and you know like i said is there's times where she would just shut down when it was pouring rain it'd take me 45 minutes to walk 200 meters about four or five six hundred feet and it would just be like, oh my gosh, and I'd be so, uh, link my Great Dane, uh, my beloved Great Dane who died of paraplegia, um, uh, um, he would be just standing there in the rain and just, we'd all be soaked. I'd have rain jacket on and rain be going through my back and my, uh, I would be soaked. But I did that to help Nina and then eventually she was able to walk and transit all over the place and she got adopted by Kathy Chow who runs my fluffy, my fluffy friend's pet store. Uh, you know, on Maple Street, I think it is in, in Kitsilano. Uh, she's a trainer herself, but um, she just, you know, when you know some, you know someone's what to do, you just send them to that person, which was me. And so uh, Nina is still hanging out and, and very adventurous and all that stuff. So so that's kind of the thing there. Um, okay, let's just see here. Uh, okay, so you know, uh, if anybody has any questions, please ask, because I'm going to probably end this very soon uh, if there's no questions. And um, uh, next time, again, this is like uh, just various topics, kind of changes for me all the time. Uh, possible discussion topics, again, is why your dog looks away when you look at them. Just an incredible codependency aspect of this part. It's just gorgeous. Uh, why dogs smell your face and other dogs' faces as well. So when you come home, when you uh, have, uh, you know, and then they, they, they come back in, like, you know, if your partner brings your dog back in, and, and then they see their other dog and they start to sniff uh, and, and their dog's faces and all that stuff. <laughs> it, it's just brilliant, the predatorial aspects of behavior on the codependency of these dogs. They, they have to develop interdependencies within the nucleus, within their own family as well. Uh, it's just gorgeous. Um, okay, and then uh, how dogs track through analysis and elimination, redundancy, rhetoric, anticipation, the field of processing, how can, you know, all that stuff, how come a, a dog can tell uh, when there's a squirrel in, in a bunch of trees and all that stuff, how do they track it? Uh, as things go on, as people start to understand what I'm talking about, then I'm going to explain that more, so. All uh, right. Then why do dogs take your socks and personal items like, you know, underwear, uh, um, uh, T-shirts and all that? Why do they squirrel it away? Why are they reactive or, or guarding it? Um, why do some dogs actually eat your personal items like socks or, 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 or uh, uh, intimate clothing? Why do they eat it? I imagine actually swallowing it. Uh, these are uh, these are aspects that are reflective of the dog psychology which when I when we get to this point it, it's, it'll take a whole whole session I'm uh, sorry a whole vlog to be able to explain that because uh, it's just in depth but it's so simple like absolutely just simple why they're doing it and then um, you know and, and uh, like I said classic academia has no idea what why they do it but it's simple it's really, really simple. Like, like it's just, 
uh, I shouldn't be the first person to know all this stuff. Uh, and why do dogs circle, right? Especially like at, at dinner time and other aspects uh, when they think you're going out. Why do they circle? Why do they circle happily? Quickly, or there's a circling in, a, in just a, a regular pace or whatever. Um, also, um, you know, how we are determining uh, logical intelligence of our dogs versus our dog's emotional intelligence. We want a dog that has logical intelligence, and they all have logical intelligence because there's an aspect of the predatorial behavior. We want the dog to have logical intelligence because a logically intelligent dog is a smarter dog. We want our dog to have a fair emotional intelligence level. The dog's IQ. And there is a way to gauge dog's IQ because you can tell. I mean, how many people have said, you know, this dog's smart, this dog's not so smart, right? I'm not going to, you're right. Um, we can figure that out as well. And we can see the brilliance of dogs. And I've said to a few people, you know, your dog is above average intelligence and your dog would learn like two-step tricks or five-step tricks and like yeah you're right it's not because i whatever it's because we watch the way the behavior of our dogs um, and then the other part was uh, i think somebody had mentioned before reactive dogs on our beds are they guarding or or are they attacking when they become reactive to us uh, there's a lot of things that are there that's a very complicated topic well it's not complicated it's pretty simple but it's complicated to explain down to explain to people um, that part is kind of interesting when Nero uh, when I first got Nero and I got him at 10 years uh, 10 years four months of age he's a Great Dane who was used for breeding caged and then he was intact he was caged for seven years and he was chained up outside for three years uh, and my dear Nero uh, they dropped him off at a kill shelter with a prong collar heavily uh, uh, scarred um, weighing 75 pounds and then he got to the foster in Alabama uh, before I even knew about him, before I even said I wanted to adopt him, and um, he had grabbed a uh, an adult off the couch at the foster's home in Alabama and pulled them onto the floor and inflicted wounds requiring 67 stitches. And the thing is, I always see these pictures, right? Because I say, well, you know, like, oh, you know, do you want to see? I'm like, yeah, okay, send it to me, whatever. Or I'll say, what do they look? What does this picture look like? Because to me, I want to see what the pictures of that wound look like, not because of the graphics aspect of it, but because I want to see where the human being was attacked. By determining where the dog attacks the human being, we determine the dog's mentality. The dog's predatorial aspects is not at play, but the dog's mentality and what the dog is expressing in a defensive or offensive measure in regards to the reaction to their environment. Right? Why do some dogs attack people in the groin? Why do some people uh, some dogs attack people from the back? Why do they go for your face? Why why does some dogs circle around you and then nip people in the back of the uh, of the ankles and all that? These are pred not predatorial behaviors. These are uh, these are uh, well there are sometimes, but there's a reason there's a there's an emotional context why these dogs are doing it. it's not it's not logically based because of the fact that the dog that is going to attack you and bite you wherever it is on the face or on, on the arms like you said i've got scars and all that stuff like that and everything why the dog is going to attack you is because there are specific reasons why it's the stimulus to the immediacy of the environment that the dog is in that we've exposed our dog to that we've triggered our dog into the process of it and then your dog decides where to attack, where to bite you, where to warn you, etc., etc. So when I had uh, Nero, and again, like I said, he's the one that uh, Nero, uh, when I went and triggered him one time after uh, the person I was living with, when she went to work in the morning, like 4 o'clock in the morning, it's pitch black, I, I triggered him on the bed, and he went up and he grabbed me by the top of the head, and he nipped me, causing me to bleed on both sides of my, my temple. And then he, then he went back down, <laughs> and laid back down, and I'm laying in the bed like... Nero, you're okay. You're okay, Nero. Hi, Nero. Hi, Nero. And I'm just, my heart is just beating. And I knew I had blood coming down the sides of my head. But the reality was Nero knew. And this is pitch black. He, he got me pitch That's how accurate they are. They know everything. Sense of sound, hypersensitivity, everything. And he just laid back down to go back to sleep. And I'm like, Nero, you're right. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. You're okay. And the heart is just pounding. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be moving too much. And then I waited uh, 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 probably probably like 12 or 15 minutes. 
And then I got up and went, I'm going to the bathroom now. And I went to the bathroom so he knew I wasn't going to go after him. And then I went and checked out the, the injuries that I received. Uh, you know, he, he could have broken my, my, my neck. Um, it was just a, a shock. I actually didn't expect him to go for my head. I thought he'd go for my hand, but obviously he, you know, he went for my head. Uh, so that was one very close call. I've had a few. I have. I have had some few. Uh, I've had close calls with Walter. Some really, really close calls with Walter. Those. Uh, I have to say, Walter is my ultimately most frightening dog I've ever worked with. Uh, well, no, actually, I've had a few, but those are the owners' dogs, and then it's because the owners don't know what's going on. They can't handle their dog properly, and I'm afraid that they're going to lose their dog's control on their leash and then attack me. And then that's never fun, uh, which has happened. But, um, you know, because uh, uh, Nero cause she, my, had gone to the gone to work and I was in the bedroom. And I was, you know, because we were living with her son as well at the time. So uh, our door was closed. So when she left work, the door was closed again because it's just normal. And uh, it's pretty frightening to be in a room uh, where a dog, giant dog, because he was 140 pounds by then where a giant dog is there who just grabbed me by the top of the head uh, of the head to warn me and I'm like what do I do uh, and there was times where he would be reactive on the bed and he would jump on the bed right away he'd run up and finally when I was able to get him to trust us and come upstairs in the bedroom he would then jump on the bed and then trying to get him off the bed he would literally guard the bed and stand on it and if we got close he would attack he didn't jump off the bed often, but we knew that that was a possibility, and it, it was pretty frightening uh, a lot of times. And we ended up sleeping on the couch uh, a number of times, and uh, eventually I migrated onto the couch as well. Um, it's an interesting dynamic. Again, it's it's really an interesting dynamic um, having a dog that um, you know is 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 a prolific uh, attack, vicious attacks. It's not just the dog that. You. This is these are dogs that um, have uh, have uh, established vicious histories. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, again, the, the the bond with dogs like that with Nero, um, it's that bond. You, you know, you go through heck and high water, and um, you go through the most extreme kind of relationship you can with anybody. You know, it'd be like living on a deserted island with one other person. You're both shipwrecked, and you live there for the next uh, two years till you're, you're you're rescued, and you end up having that bond with that person, even if you hated them before you even got on the island, because you know for whatever reason, you end up uh, getting that bond because you've learned to trust each other, and then you have this incredible visceral connection, this soul-based connection, this codependent connection. And uh, that never, never leaves uh, beyond death as well. It never, never leaves. So, um, you know, anyways, go on in that part. So I will end this off. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, bearing with me that this late time period. I know only a couple people watching. Uh, I really appreciate you all for just staying there and watching, uh, watching my vlog. Uh, please share my vlog. Uh, please uh, share it to your pages. Uh, to your Facebook as well. Help me get out the word, my word, yes, but help me get out the word to to other dog owners who are struggling with their reactive dogs. Help me help them. Help help them understand that the issues that they're having with the reactive dogs, their dangerous dogs, can actually all be addressed. And it's not as bad as they think it is. Not as bad as the trainers and behaviors who are uns unskilled are telling them. Not as bad as the people at the top of the dog training industry and the people who are at the top of the science, animal science, uh, behavior science, uh, um, you know, pyramid. Let uh, trainers and behaviors, all this, you know, let let. Let these owners, let these friends of yours know that there is a way to work with the dogs. And I can prove it 100% across the board. And, you know, everyone says, yeah, well, James, you got a rare gift with dogs and all that stuff. But the reality is I'm teaching the, 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 the families, the owners themselves to do it themselves. And they are doing it themselves. Look at any all my feedback. It's consistent on that part. So this is something that we can change the world. And, and we can't let 
the industry suppress something that they don't even understand, but it works 100% of the time, and the the lives of our dogs are at risk. Okay, thank you everybody for for tuning in, for watching. I really appreciate the the faith everyone has in me, and um, you know I'm just gonna keep doing this. You know the, the introvert coming out here and just stepping out, and um, you know maybe one day I'll be able to figure out how to do live vlogs. Thank you everybody. Have a good night. Bye bye.